Bruce, thanks for coming in. It's my pleasure. I'm a big fan of your show, oh, of both you. your shows. So you're the one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's very kind of it's you to say. It's very exciting. No, I'm a, I listen to your show all the time and uh, love the, you know, what you did with the music uh, on the morning show. And uh, now you're here and meeting you. And it's, uh, I couldn't be more excited. Couldn't Just, be more happy. I'm all, I'm, all, uh, I'm all distraught here. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. You're a hero of mine and a lot of people. Oh, God love you, Bruce. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. I, I, you know, I was getting ready for this interview and I couldn't help but notice that everywhere I looked, everything you did, there was so much music in all of your films. Let me to think that, are you a musician? Do you play music? No, I make films so I can hang around musicians, basically, I think, <laughs> <laughs> and be cool, you know? You never played? Never? I play. What do you play? A little bit. I play, uh, I play a mean three-chord guitar. Yeah. A little rhythm, you know, a little piano. Yeah. But I'm a terrible musician. My father had a, an acoustic guitar that he bought for 300 bucks and I told my buddy that and he said, "Oh yeah, 100 bucks a chord." Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those guitars where the the fret and the strings are about 3 inches apart. Oh yeah. I that. Yes. That that's that makes you tough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you could, let's just say a, a magic wand came down. Uh. You were visited in the middle of the night by a spirit yeah. with a magic wand. Yeah. Don't ask how they're holding the wand. Yeah. <laughs> and and they say, Bruce, you can either continue being a successful director or I can make you an incredible musician right now. Bam. What, do you, what do you choose? I, I, I'd probably go rhythm guitar or saxophone. More than directing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Is that so? I mean, directing's a great, great gig. Don't get me wrong. And the money's actually pretty good. Probably mm -hmm. better than being a... A, a touring musician. Rhythm but, guitar, hundreds of dollars a year, Bruce, I tell you. But I don't know. It's just, uh, I don't know, the joy, the beauty. I, w I would, you know, if it was a, you know, third-rate cover band touring northern Ontario, I am in. <laughs> <laughs> I am in. Our phone lines are lighting up, <laughs> people calling in. So let's play a little game. I'm going to play uh, some songs either from your films or inspired by your films. We'll okay. listen to them and talk a little about them. Sure, yeah. Fantastic. Sound good to you? Yeah. All right, so this is from your new film. This is Weirdos. It's set in Nova Scotia. They're going from Nova Scotia to Cape Breton. Two teens hitchhiking in the, in the what, 70s, late 70s? 1976, or? July 3rd and 4th. Trying to figure out exactly who they are. And 70s Canadian soft rock features prominently throughout the film. Um, just tell me before we listen to something, what was the inspiration behind that? Uh, well, behind the music, we wanted... Uh, Canada on the radio and America on TV. This was a sort of uh, the weekend of the American Bicentennial, which was a big party going on south of the border. So we thought, what is what are the beautiful summer sounds that you would hear on the radio? And uh, we kind of dipped into this as a CanCon uh, gold mine because that was very popular at that time. It was a kind of a new thing on the radio, right. relatively new thing. I don't remember a time before CanCon, but it must have been at one year there was lots of American music yeah. on the radio, and then the next year... Yeah, it was uh, a lot of these new artists that uh, came up, be partly because of that ruling, that you could uh, suddenly hear uh, your songs on the radio, and that was it created a whole new sort of propulsion and dynamic and I think inspiration for people making music to think, wow, we can actually hear it on the radio. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. So let's listen to some of yeah. it. This is Edward Beer with Last Song. This is hard for me to say, but this is all that I can say. Come on, it's the I know. Last huh? time that I'll tell you just how much I feel like some titles should be scrolling, you know, like in a Time Life commercial. Absolutely. Where does that song take you? Uh, it took me behind the furnace in grade eight with uh, Sean <laughs> Pritchard, The First Kiss. Is that so? At the last song. And uh, yeah, grade eight, Rexdale. Um, it was sort of the slow dance song. And... Uh, so <laughs> for me, it has, has extra, extra uh, memory, uh, memory shine to me. Uh, and it's just like one of those sweet, beautiful, lovely, gorgeous songs. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we were choosing songs from the 70s, I couldn't help but pluck Edward Bear out of the basket. And uh, yeah, they played at our high school. That was something bands did uh, in the day. I, they had the high school circuit. Yeah. And uh, people like uh, Max Webster. Well, a friend of mine booked Max Webster, and I asked him a question. I said, you know, when did you get into the music industry? He said, the first thing I ever did was I booked Max Webster <laughs> at my high school. 
And I thought, Max Webster, <laughs> bands yes. used to play high schools. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Edward Bear, Max Webster, Foot in Cold Water. I think Rush might have played high schools. I can't be sure. They but did. I think they, they op- did. I think they opened at high schools. Yeah, yeah. So it was a big thing. Liv- there was a band called Liverpool that did all Beatles songs. So it was a, ver- it was a very popular thing, a high school dance rock wow. concert. You, you even found your, one of your protagonists in the film even wears an Edward Bear T-shirt. Yeah. Is that an original or did you get that made? No, we just made that. Okay. Yeah. I thought it was dug out of your yeah. closet. <laughs> where, do you, where do you hope that this music, when you're watching it, takes the person watching it because you know this is this is before my time Mm. but i definitely felt something while i was watching it what what are you hoping for when people hear this music uh you know that sort of the the sweet sounds of the 70s i guess our it was funny our editor duff smith who uh is in his 20s and all this music is new to him so he Started, to, you know, we would go through the catalog, and he would he fell in love with the Stampeders and right. Edward Bear and April Wine, and uh, I don't know, it's just the kind of the maybe the production, the sound of it takes you to a uh, to that sort of warm, lovely place. Takes you to summertime, I think. We were trying to get people to summertime, and it's uncynical music. I think yeah. that's what I like about it. Like I, st- I sometimes think that April Wine is the the great underrated Canadian band. Oh yeah, because they're well known. Yeah, but they're better than they're known. Oh yeah, and I think people kind of chuckle at them sometimes. But boy, are they a great band! Oh no, they're fantastic, and they yeah. mean it. Yeah, you know, there's no irony. There's no irony. They no. go for it, and uh, yeah, great production, great songwriting, uh, and that's what again uh, made me happy and and surprised our editor Duff. You know what? Let's not continue the interview. Let's just play April Wine. You got a full record? We'll just put the whole thing on. <laughs> but as going back to what I was saying at the beginning, just as a filmmaker, you use music so much more than other filmmakers. Mm-hmm. What do you love about music instead of dialogue and sometimes to tell a story? Uh, well, you know, it's funny. Dialogue is... Uh, I was I do a lot of television and it's really fun and, and television is a lot of dialogue and and I always look to movies as sound and picture sound and image and um, I don't know music is so evocative it can take you places we started out making road movies and I always associate playing music with driving down the road you you know, always have your your little box of uh, CDs or whatever whatever it is you're bringing along so that sort of uh, the music and that sort of forward propulsion. Um, that music gives you, um, yeah, it's uh, it's part and parcel of movement and movement and music. Movies are supposed to move, mm-hmm. and music is a great uh, is a great engine to uh, whoops uh, is a great engine for uh, for emotion. You know, movies are you know ultimately emotional experiences, and, and music is one of you know probably the to me one of the the closest or one of the closest things you can experience uh, cuz i think there are moments in your films where there could be dialogue mm. like people could be saying something and mm. then you hear the song and they don't really need to say it right. do you know what i mean yeah like you you get the feeling of what you're trying to get across through a song is that intentional yes i mean uh, whether it's just the sonics and the production or often the lyrics can comment on you know what somebody might be feeling or thinking or want to say and often the music says it way better than our <laughs> our sad attempts at uh, verbal communication <laughs> <laughs> On that, let's play a song. <laughs> um, of course, I, I want to talk a little bit about Hardcore Logo, um, you know, a breakout film for you back in 1996 that I will admit to you, Bruce, I only saw recently. Oh, like, okay, Because yeah. like another person in their 20s, I, you know, I think I missed it when, yeah. when it first came yeah. out. And it's so interesting to watch it now. Yeah. Like it's so, and, and as someone who's done that run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done that, that, right, that right. Western Canadian yeah, run a yeah. few times. I want to play a song from one of the songs featured in the film. This is a Sonic Reducer. I just want to make a gif out of you mouthing the words to Sonic Reducer as they play. 
That's the that's the hardcore logo too, right? Those are the guys in the film. Oh yeah, yeah. That's uh, Joe Dick singing, Billy Talon on guitar, John Oxenberger on bass, and Pipe Fitter on drums. Pipe Fitter on the drums. <laughs> uh, the fictional band Hardcore Logo, which are in no way fictional in our hearts, from the film of the same name, a song called Sonic Reducer. If you're wondering who I'm talking to. I'm speaking with Bruce McDonald, uh, the director. We're looking back and listening to a few songs from some of his movies. I want to talk about, you just said that sometimes lyrics and sometimes the right song can say more than a piece of dialogue can. Mm. What does that song say about Joe Dick? What does that song say about Hardcore Logo? Uh, that is... Uh... Uh, that is this. That is this. That's the two basically. middle fingers. Yeah. That's the two middle fingers. That's uh, Joe's uh, philosophy. Uh, and it's just so great. It's so compact and so efficient and such a, uh, a, a missile of intention, that song and that attitude. And, you know, you have him, you know, belting out that with this uh, all pistons firing in the band behind him. And it's, it, it's, uh, it's a rocket to the moon, you know, and, and you know that guy. You know from that choice of song and from that delivery, you don't need to say too much else about his past, his experiences. You know who that character is. Because that's, that's an older song, right? That's a, yeah, that's a Dead Boy song. 70, right? like 77-ish, I guess. So was it the kind of thing where you heard that song and you said, oh, I can not hear me snapping, but that's the one. That describes who this guy is. That's the perfect song for Hardcore Logo to play. I think so. I mean, that came out of maybe uh, Peter Moore who uh, is a record producer in town. He helped on the music, and that was the one song we picked for a cover song of theirs. I think it was Peter that helped pick that song, uh, and we just thought it was perfect. And And I listened to the Dead Boys recording of it, and I thought, I think the hardcores did it better. <laughs> so I was very... <laughs> <laughs> was that a painstaking process for you, making sure the music was right? Uh, yes, especially in a, mus in, in a movie about band members or bands, because usually the, the you know the movie's okay, but the music is terrible, and uh, we didn't we wanted to avoid the Eddie and the Cruisers trap. And, and well, I don't know what what do you mean? Well, it was a, that was a movie about a fictional band, and just it was just kind of lame and right sort of overworked or overcooked or something like that. So we went into this wanting, to, you know, we thought, okay, well, we'll just show little bits of the music of the band playing. And it, and it turned out that the music by Peter Moore and uh, lyrics by Michael Turner and, and music by the Swamp Baby uh, was like this perfect storm in the music. So we ended up, you know, being able to showcase the music in the movie a little bit better. I think watching the film like recently, as I did, I had some really kind of strange thoughts about it. One was that uh, obviously I could feel there, there must have been a lot of pressure to portray the punk rock scene as authentic. Mm. However, there is a tendency when you look at like SLC punk, if you look at punk films, mm. to romanticize what, what punk rock mm. really is. Whereas it can be a quite lonely, mm. sad, yeah, nihilistic mm. enterprise. Did you feel that pressure to to get punk rock right? Uh, a little bit. I mean, I had a great advantage in that Michael Turner, who wrote the book, was in a band called Hard Rock Miners, and that was a kind of a more pogsy, I guess, folk punk band out of Vancouver. And having Hugh Dillon in the movie, who was a front man for the Headstones, Headstones yeah. they both brought that kind of authenticity to... Uh, they had good sort of uh, BS detectors in terms of like, well, we wouldn't wear this, we wouldn't do this, we wouldn't say this. And it was it helped make the movie have uh, a bit more of a stamp of authenticity to have uh, a guy like Hugh and a guy like uh, Tur Michael Turner and, and Peter Moore and Swamp Baby kind of all helping to kind of point toward something that was uh, uh, made through passion and something that you would make in your basement rather than you know, something that was designed uh, by bigger forces. But also a vulnerability for them, because it's one thing for them to get up and, and play rock and roller and play mm. rock star, but they mm. also had to admit that as the lead singer of a Headstones, as, as, as the lead singer of any band, again, it's an incredibly lonely enterprise. And you had to get that right, too. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what struck me about, I think, the reading the book by Michael Turner, and you know it as a sort of traveling... Uh, somebody traveling through the West. It's like traveling through outer space in a tiny little spaceship. It's like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles between gigs and that kind of moment of high excitement and high performance is a short, short time in the big, you know, weeks of touring. Yeah. And uh, my, S, my, my admiration, my, uh, yeah, for musicians just went way up after 
kind of living that life through the through the text and the kind of experience of making that movie. I have a friend of mine, and if you're listening to this right now and, and you have perspective on this, please write in that more bands have broken up on the drive between Winnipeg and Toronto <laughs> than any other stretch of road in history. Does it happen in Thunder Bay? Is that where it happens? I think it's if you don't have a gig in Thunder Bay yeah. and you get there right. and you go, oh, we got to get to Winnipeg. Yeah, yeah. We don't have time to stop yeah. for pancakes in Thunder Bay. And, just... it's, and if you can make it as a band in this country, it's unlike anywhere else in the world, like America, Germany, the distances you travel to get from one place to the next are, you know, people in other countries are astonished at the, the lengths that bands will go to to mm-hmm. kind of, you know, put on the show and do the tour. Let's talk about another one of those bands. I want to talk about this movie is Broken. In this, a young man tries to convince his longtime crush to be his girlfriend by taking her to a Broken Social Scene concert in Toronto. Mm. So this is another band, Broken Social Scene, that has logged countless hours Mm. with about 28 of them on the road. Yes. Let's have a listen to one of the songs from the film. song, I think, that, that turned me on to Broken Social Scene. That was, yes. the, that was the song that did it for me. Uh, that's Anthems for a 17-Year-Old Girl. It was featured in This Movie is Broken. It's by Broken Social Scene. It was directed by Bruce McDonald, and Bruce joins me in studio right now. Tell me about Broken Social Scene. Why does this band mean so much to you? Uh, they've made perfect records, and uh, I remember... Uh, I guess that song, I think, and a few others from that album struck me in this one summer time. Uh, and they just, it, it's like a lot of, to a lot of people, it spoke to them. It was kind of magical and ephemeral and fantastic. And uh, yeah, I, I, I've, I don't know what it is exactly that it speaks to me, uh, but it seems authentic and beautiful and, and uh, emotional. But, but it also seems like you don't have any, how do I put this, like restrictions of nostalgia on your tastes. Like I would think that someone who would make Hardcore Logo in the mid-1990s right. would be unable to admit that Broken Social Scene are good. You know, they would be they would be kind of stuck with, oh, there's there's Hardcore, there's Minor Threat, there's Fugazi. Right. Or there's like Mud Honey and, and right. Stone Type of Pilots and Pearl Jam. And that then there's the stuff that the kids are listening to. Right. But you seem to have a pretty open mind in, in terms of new music too. I think so. I hope so. You know, you always want to be open to new things. And, uh, you know, that was that summer when that record came out. I think that was, for a lot of people's ears, that was a new sound, you know, and that was the sound of Toronto at that time. And um, I feel lucky to be on that ship and uh, <clears throat> follow them along. Um, yeah, I like to be eclectic, you know, everything from, you know, jazz to, I don't know, Gregorian chants. Oh, yeah. to... I like Gregorian chants, man. <laughs> a good Gregorian chant every once in a while is all right. I was at a, I was at a concert one time <laughs> and I was sitting next to the mayor of St. John's. Yeah. I couldn't have been more than 14 years old. Yeah. And his name was Andy Wells at the time. He was okay. hilarious mayor. A very odd guy. Right? Yeah. I love I mean, I don't get sued for that, but he's a great guy. So I sat next to him and he said to me, he said, you're into music, are you? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm into music, you know, because I was in this choir. Mm-hmm. And he says, did you ever listen to Gregorian chant? <laughs> I listen to it all the time. <laughs> and I learned about Gregorian chant <laughs> from in the Arts and Culture Center in St. John's, Newfoundland from the mayor of St. John's, that Andy is, Wells. That is awesome. Yeah. I feel, I feel good about it. <laughs> it feels good to get that off my chest. Can we play a little chanting? Uh, can we slip one in? No, that's just what we do before we start the show. Okay. Every morning we all put our yeah. arms together and... That's Q, what I saw through the Q, window here when I was Q. waiting to come in. Yeah, that's what you guys are <laughs> yeah. doing. Our robes, okay. they, they yeah. need to be dry cleaned. Everything we played so far is is a Canadian song. Mm. Most of the songs featured in your films are, are Canadian songs, almost explicitly so. Is that a deliberate choice for you? Ah, uh, not necessarily. I'm, you know, a big fan of other, you know, uh, you know, Ramones and Oasis and other, you know, fantastic bands. Um, when I when it, I guess it comes time time to making things and you're kind of creating something, you're putting something together. A movie incorporates all kinds of different elements. I tend to use that punk rock aesthetic of like you know uh, do it yourself or use what you've got around you and uh, because music. Are, is a big part of the films I make. I kind of reach out to people that I know or might know or that are possible to uh, to uh, get on the phone. 
and uh, or music that I just like that's around that seems part of the land that you're making the music for and of. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, if I'm making a movie in Toronto or out on the road in Northern Ontario, you, you tend to want to find the music that comes from that land. The land does make the music, I think, and uh, uh, it's always a great journey. Sometimes you're finding music that, you know, you're using music that you know already, and other times you're discovering things uh, as you go down that, that, that path. I promise I'm not asking the what's next for Bruce McDonald question. Uh, like I, I promise I'm asking. I don't yeah, want, I, yeah, I'm yeah. not crazy about that question. <laughs> However, like as someone who's curious about new music, as someone who's always listening to new music, and as someone who seems to associate a narrative or a setting with music, yeah. do you hear anything? Do you see anything when you listen to new music? Is there is there something coursing through your brain? Well, it's funny. You know, I was I was at this. Uh, Two, two different shows. There's a filmmaker in town called Peter Mettler, and he's famous or known for doing these documentaries like Gambling Gods and LSD. And he's into visual uh, image DJ mixing right now. So he'll he'll take a bank of images and he'll mix them live to a show, Okay, which is pretty fantastic. Yeah. And then I saw this Daniel Lenoir show at the music hall. And he was, you know, he had this new record, uh, Flesh and Machine, which he called uh, Music of the future, I think, a little bit. It's kind of this really beautiful ambient stuff. And when I look at Peter's mixing, I think of those as films of the future. So my dream, if I have, I don't know if I have anything to do with it, but to sort of, I'd love to see those two guys come together, uh, Lanois and Peter Mettler. Um, in terms of next for me... Uh, uh, but do you see music being part of your filmmaking oh, yeah, going forward? Absolutely. There's a there's a group, the fantastic group of Montreal stars, mm -hmm. uh, Amy Milan, Torquil Campbell, and that group. So we're actually working with them now on a project. Kind of, uh, they have inspired the some of the sonics and the story around it. So I'm very excited about that. That's coming up soon. I think. Look, I got the answer to the question <laughs> without even asking it. Um, thanks a lot for coming in, man. I really appreciate it. Well, it's my pleasure.